Welcome, Dr. Tony Kess. So I'm Bhavna Ravi Prasad from IBM and DeepSense. I work as a technical advisor. And I here today, I'm here to present myself and present you for this discovery session. And for all the attendees over here, Dr. Tony Kess is a PhD holder from the University of Gulf, and he is currently a researcher in Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Today, he is with us to give a presentation on protecting the salmons using machine learning. So I'm just going to pass on the host to him and he would be taking up from here. If you guys have any questions, you could post it on the Q&A in your screen and we would be responding whenever the session is over. So now I'm going to hand over the session to Dr. Tony Kess. Ready? Uh, hopefully, folks can can see my screen. Um, okay. So, uh, thank you for that introduction, first of all, and thank you for for coming out to uh, my presentation today on some of the work that we've been doing uh, to use both genomics and, and machine learning to to understand and conserve uh, Atlantic salmon. So as introduced, uh, I'm Tony Kess. I am uh, currently a researcher at Fisheries and Oceans Canada at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography here in Dartmouth. Um, but today I'm presenting from my attic. Uh, and so my work focuses on identifying the genomic basis of adaptation in marine species and using that information to inform how we might better protect and conserve them. Um, and so my contact is up there as well. So for today's talk, I'm gonna provide some background on biodiversity and how it's changing and genetic diversity um, and then go into some of the tools that we use to analyze genomic data uh, that we can use to make inferences about that biodiversity and, geno and genetic diversity and the role that machine learning tools are beginning to play uh, in that analysis of that data. I'll provide some background on the species we're working on, Atlantic salmon uh, for this project, and then go into a specific project that we have carried out uh, in collaboration with folks from DeepSense uh, to identify an important life history trait and the genes that underlie it in Atlantic salmon. Oh, sorry about that, everybody. So we are entering an era of unprecedented loss of biodiversity over short time frames, and human impacts are the major contributors to these global losses of biodiversity uh, across the, the multiple kingdoms of life. And so I put up a figure here from a study uh, that came out in 2019, which was the largest, largest survey to date of biodiversity, uh, which found that across species and across kind of major uh, taxonomic groups, pretty much every group has a large proportion of species that are threatened with extinction. And the major driver of these uh, changes in biodiversity are the result of human exploitation and, and use of these different species, uh, either directly or indirectly. And in marine systems, uh, both exploitation directly through fishing uh, and then indirect effects of pollution and habitat destruction and climate change all contribute to these losses as well. So in addition to the loss of actual species, we're beginning to understand that there's also changes that are happening at a finer scale to diversity within species. And these changes can have ecological consequences as well. Um, so this intraspecific diversity or variation within species is often reflected in adaptation to different environments or different behaviors like different life history traits or, or life cycle traits or different migratory behaviors. And these often have really important ecological functions as well. Uh, so a recent study done by DeRoche and colleagues in 2018 found that when looking at changes to ecosystems uh, at, due to perturbations either through loss of individual species or changes to the diversity within specific species, about half the time those changes to uh, diversity within species were as or more important than changes to actual species presence or absence within an ecosystem. So this intraspecific variation is often as important as species themselves. And so identifying and monitoring this variation is really important in maintaining ecosystem function and resilience and ensuring that there are natural resources that are available both for human use and for the kind of continued persistence of the, ser the services that we, we get directly from ecosystems. And so this is where genomic tools and, bio, and bioinformatics have been useful in the past decade. Uh, and so just as a very general definition of what this refers to, 
Uh, genomics and bioinformatics are the study of genetic variation within individuals and species using very large genetic data sets, millions of markers spread across the genome from hundreds to hundreds of thousands of individuals. And these differ from genetic studies, which used a few representative regions of the genome to make a very broad inference about something that was happening to a population or a species. Um, and these studies uh, now comprise big data sets requiring computationally intensive analyses. So on the top right there, I've put up a figure that is from my master's thesis at UBC in 2012, in which I was working with six molecular markers in Douglas fir. And the big challenge for that project was actually just generating the data. So spending hours in the lab, running polymerase chain reactions, trying to actually get markers to work in the lab, and then making some sort of inference from these blobs that we see on a gel. All of this has become ad, uh, automated and scaled up uh, to, a, to a huge degree. And so in comparison on the bottom right there, we now have a single figure that's generated that has millions of data points from across all sorts of different chromosomes within a species from thousands of individuals. So the challenge isn't actually generating the data anymore, it's making sense of it. And so genome sequencing has become much cheaper very rapidly. Uh, for the past two decades since the completion of the Human Genome Project, it has consistently outpaced Moore's law. So it's cheaper every year and easier to generate more genomic data than you will generate in terms of gains in computational power across years. And with expansion of uh, these available genome sequences, the quality of these genomes has gone up as well. So right after I, or right before I graduated high school, uh, the Human Genome Project that first sequenced human genome was completed in 2001. And that cost between two and $3 billion and resulted in an okay single genome. Um, and since then, there's been this massive uh, expansion of available genome sequences across species, not limited to humans. So on the right here, I have a figure showing the completed reference genomes to date, and this is 2018, so there's more now, uh, of different fish species. And every single one of these is of higher quality than the initial human genome. And the cost and time scale required to actually generate this data has gone down substantially. And so we can begin to use this genomic data in management of marine species. And we can use this data to make inferences about the genetic diversity uh, within species and how it's arrayed within populations to identify their population structure. And then we can also identify adaptive variation. So some variation that might be important in the genome that determines how different species or individuals within species respond to changes in climate. And with that data, we can make inferences about past impacts, so things that have affected populations in the past, as well as make predictions about how populations might respond in the future. So one of the, the main features of uh, populations that we attempt to quantify using genomic data is population structure. So how genetic diversity is arrayed within groups. And greater sharing of genetic variation indicates the same population. So individuals that are within the same gene pool are in the same population and they share a lot of diversity. But as populations move further apart in terms of the amount of genetic material they exchange, they become more genetically distinct. And these distinct populations may respond differently to disturbances or they may be adapted to different environments. So in management of marine species or species generally in management of biodiversity, it's important to be able to delineate different populations and identify different groups that may require different plans for conservation. And so one of the main tools that's been used for detection of population structure is principal component analysis. And this is, I would say, probably my favorite tool for working with genomic data. Um, so it is a multivariate statistical technique uh, in which a matrix of data is subjected to a transformation which maximizes the variance on each axis through, rotate, through a rotation of that initial data. Uh, and then it's subjected to repeated rotations. And each time it's rotated, the axis that explains the next greatest amount of variation within the data is identified with the condition that that uh, axis is uncorrelated with all of the previous axes as well. And so this has some nice features for analysis of genomic data. Uh, one is that it allows really clear visualization of population structure. So I've put up a figure here from a fairly uh, iconic paper that came out in 2008 by November and colleagues. And what they did was that they took genomic data from human populations across Europe that were in different databases. And they just subjected that data to a principal component analysis. And what they found was that individuals population of origin really closely matched their position from the genomic data on a PCA as well. 
So to me, this is kind of amazing because it means that you can take uh, data from a wild population and subject it to a simple rotation of that data. And you end up pulling out kind of the major axes of variation and really clearly visualizing how that diversity is arrayed within different populations. Uh, another feature that's useful with this tool is that it allows the detection of distinct sources of variation on different axes of the principal component as well. So different axes may correspond to different sources of population structure, so different types of geographic variation or separation, or in species like fish, which are widespread across ocean basins, uh, potentially different uh, differences in local climate or differences in salinity or some environmental feature which may be important and which may change in the future as well. Uh, these also have a clear genealogical interpretation, so they're good proxies for genetic distance between individuals. Individuals that are close together in a PCA share lots of genes. Individuals that are far apart don't share very many genes at all. So beyond just characterizing population structure, we may also be interested in finding regions of the genome that are important for maintaining that population structure or maintaining adaptations within environments. So genetic variation associated with adaptation in different environments. And genomic scale data allows detection of this variation. And so the way that we do this is that we find associations between an important trait uh, for fish, for example, migration, and specific genes. And the primary tool for doing this is a method called genome-wide association. And you see genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, uh, reported fairly regularly in the media. Whenever you see a news release that has some information on the identification of some gene for a disease trait or uh, some, uh, some disease trait or some susceptibility to disease, the method that's been used is a genome-wide association study. And the statistical tool that's actually used to, to get at these inferences, some of which are really powerful, they've led to significant medical insights, is just a linear model. So it's just using linear, reg uh, linear regression to predict traits from genomic data. So taking all of those different regions of the genome or genotypes for individuals that you have, often millions of different uh, rows of data, and putting those each independently into a, a simple uh, you know, high school math, y equals mx plus b linear model. And the significance of each of those associations is then represented by a p-value. And these are often presented in what's called a Manhattan plot, which you can see here, which on the x-axis shows the position and chromosome of every single surveyed region of the genome or molecular marker. And on the y-axis has the significant score of that region of the genome. And so regions that fall above some significant score uh, often will show up as these kind of heightened peaks on this, this uh, Manhattan plot. Um, and so those will give information about genes that might be important in that trait of interest. Uh, but this is a little bit of a challenge as well uh, because bio biology is complex and not everything that uh, is important for variation in a trait can be captured necessarily by a linear model that has a significance cutoff. And there's two features of genomic bases of traits that are often underrepresented or, or not well represented by uh, genome-wide association tools. One is polygenicity. So the reality that many genes with small effects tend to contribute to a trait and often major effect loci are the ones that are easy to detect in genome-wide association, but a lot of the heritability of a trait is left on the table in that case, unexplained by additional genetic variation. Um, that may exist below the kind of significance cutoff that's been used, but that may still be important in, in, bio, bio, in biological reality. Uh, a second feature is epistasis. So genes interact with each other to produce non-additive contributions. A gene on its own, even of major effect, doesn't do anything. It has to exist within a tissue, within a genome, and within an individual, within an environmental context. But what that means is that those interactions between genes with each other, within tissues and within environments are fail to be captured by uh, inclusion of individual regions of the genome um, in linear models. And so these features are not easily captured by traditional population genomic methods. And so what this means is that it's possible maybe that machine learning tools might be better suited to picking up some of this important variation. And so one tool that's recently been explored uh, for modeling genomic variation associated with traits is random forest, uh, which involves resampling replicate decision trees to maximize classification rates or variation explained in some feature uh, that a researcher is attempting to predict. And so the way this plays out uh, very generally is that decision trees are built with different nodes on them. At each point, a predictor is placed 
on one of these nodes and individuals from different groups or with different variation are then split among these trees. And as these trees are grown with more predictors, uh, the, the error rate or the prediction possibility uh, of the algorithm improves. And so comparisons of assignment of training and test data sets can be, can be made across sets of predictors uh, to provide some inference about the error rate or the, the level of prediction possible with this algorithm. So either using a method called out of bag error or mean squared error. And so one of the advantages of these tools is that there's no assumptions about the underlying process or the relationships among genes that are put into this algorithm. And so they may be better suited to pick up some of that complexity and that variation that's failing to be captured in genome-wide association uh, methods. So we used some of these tools in our study of Atlantic salmon. And so Atlantic salmon is an economically and culturally and ecologically important fish. It contributes to a subsistence and recreational fishery, uh, which is valued in the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. And wild populations also harbor very important genetic diversity uh, for the maintenance of ecosystems. And they're a keystone species and an important nutrient source across environments. So one of the, the amazing features of Atlantic salmon is that they undertake this massive migration to sea to mature and back from sea to spawn. And while this happens, they're moving large amounts of nutrients from the freshwater environment to the marine environment. And then when they return to spawn, they're moving nutrients from the marine environment back to freshwater environments, but those nutrients are even then moved to terrestrial environments as well. So studies have been done that show tracking nutrients from the, the ocean, those, those nutrients have found their ways into trees adjacent to the rivers these fish are returning to, and those trees tend to grow larger around rivers that have salmon spawning in them than those that don't. So the presence or absence of salmon is important beyond just the actual existence of the fishery. They play a key role in maintaining the forest ecosystem around them as well as the freshwater and marine environments they're in. Uh, and unfortunately, they've been experiencing ongoing declines since 1975. And so they show significant intraspecific variation uh, in, a, in a major trait, which we call sea age, which is their variation and their age at maturation, or how long they spend in the sea accumulating nutrients. And these are referred to sometimes as sea winters as well. So different individuals spend between one and five years at sea, getting larger and preparing to spawn. And this differs between individuals and also differs significantly between individual rivers as well. And the way that this functions is a potential trade-off between different life history strategies or life cycle strategies. So fish that spend one or no years at sea fail to accumulate a lot of nutrients within individual competitions for uh, attracting mates, or in terms of the number of eggs that they produce, they actually fare relatively poorly. But fish that spend more time at sea are able to acquire more nutrients and become larger and produce more eggs, but the longer they're at sea, the more they're exposed to potential mortality rates at sea as well, because the ocean is a, a dangerous place to be for salmon. And we know that salmon have undergone declines both since 1975 and even more recently since 2000 as well. Uh, so this is some recent work using genomic data uh, carried out by Sarah Leonard uh, that I was lucky enough to be involved in as well. And we found that there have been significant declines that we can pick up using genetic data uh, across populations in both European and North American populations. About 60% of salmon rivers are declining. And these declines are significantly associated with climate and waters around both continents. But there's a lot of variation that can be attributed probably to mortality at sea as well, the, the larger bulk of that variation in which populations are declining. And those larger multi-sea winter fish uh, have experienced greater exploitation and declines as well. Uh, partially because they spend more time at sea, and also because they are larger and they are more valuable, and they're often targeted in fisheries. And so we're seeing the loss of this variation in interspecific diversity and variation in this important life history trait. And that's a significant problem because these, uh, the diversity of these different life history strategies is important for population persistence across time. We know a little bit already about the genetic basis of this sea age variation. Uh, so it's been shown to be heritable and have a genetic basis in breeding experiments. And genomic studies have begun in European Atlantic salmon populations. And these studies have found major effect loci underlying sea age variation, specifically in Europe, at two regions of the genome. So a gene on chromosome 25 called BGLL3 and a gene on chromosome 9 called 6.6 
both exhibit very strong control of this trait in wild populations, explaining about half of the variation in whether individuals return from sea after one year or multiple years. But there's also a lot of variation in this genetic basis as well. So more recent work by Sinclair Waters and her colleagues that came out last year showed that using a massive breeding experiment, they were able to find some of that polygenic variation beyond those two large effect genes as well. And so there's, they found approximately 100 additional genes that might be predictive of some of that variation as well. Uh, additionally, there's less evidence for a role for those large effect genes in North American populations. So work by Boulding and colleagues in 2019 failed to find either VGLL3 or 66 in North American salmon populations. So what this means is that for the North American salmon populations that are undergoing decline, we don't know much about the genetic basis of this life history trait that determines CH variation. And it's important to actually identify this uh, variation because we can use it in management and potential restoration of declining North American salmon populations, uh, partially through being able to actually survey the genetic diversity of these populations at this variation important for CH variation, and then potentially make decisions around which populations may require greater protection as well. So to get at this genomic basis of this trait, we carried out a genome-wide study using 540 fish sampled from across the Canadian range of Atlantic salmon in eight separate populations. And we have about nine and a half million regions across the genome. And initially we tested uh, two of those different methods that I, I discussed before. We detected population structure using a principal component analysis, and we used linear regression to carry out a genome-wide association study using that life history variation for each of our individual fish. Because each fish that returned has scales that we can use to determine how long it's spent at sea. So we have equal numbers of both fish that spent one year at sea in multiple years. So initially exploring the population structure, we see clear splits between populations in uh, New Brunswick and Quebec and Southern Quebec on the right and populations along Labrador and Northern Quebec on the left. Uh, so this population structure is kind of what we would expect if most of the variation between these populations is driven by geography. And on that second PC axis, uh, on the Y axis there, we see Quebec populations are primarily separated as well. Um, so a second less correlated axis there that shows another source of population structure. Uh, we don't see anything associated specifically with that life history variation in this PCA, but it's nice to see that individuals from the same population are clustering together and that those clusters correspond to geographic variation. That tells us that we sequenced the right thing and there's nothing wrong with how we've analyzed the genomic data. So that was a relief to me. The next thing that we did is that we carried out a genome-wide association study. And we split this into female and male groups and those different population clusters that we picked up in the principal component analysis as well. And the striking thing here, and it's in the kind of darker blue color here on this Manhattan plot, is that we only find one region of the genome that comes out as significant across all of these comparisons. And that is the region that has VGLL3 in it. And it's specific to female fish in Quebec and New Brunswick. So using those linear models, uh, even though we can see that there were fish that had different life history strategies, we were only able to pick up one gene and one group that was significantly associated with this life history variation. But uh, we know from that work by Sinclair Waters and we know from this breeding experiments that this trait has a genetic basis, even if it is not showing up in this current genome-wide association method. So we then used random forest to predict CH from genotype panels. We picked different sizes of panels and we, we estimated how the prediction and classification rate uh, changed across different sizes of panels, ranging from 50 to 1,000 regions of the genome. And we characterized this using out-of-bag error rate. Then when we found that our out-of-bag error rate or our classification rate stabilized, we then carried out a principal component analysis on the set of the regions of the genome or genes uh, that were best predictive of the CH variation. And what we found, and this was pretty surprising to me, is that by the time we reached about 500 regions of the genome, so that's, that's what SNP refers to there, uh, these molecular markers were able to capture about 90% of the variation in CH across these, di these different individuals. So even though we were not able to pick out individual regions of the genome that were significant in a linear model, 
by using 500 different regions of the genome in a random forest model, we were able to actually detect a huge proportion of predictive variation across the genome. And this was true for all of these different groups as well. When we subjected that data then to a principal component analysis, we see instead of clustering by population, we instead get out clustering by sea age variation. So single sea winter fish tend to be on the left, multi sea winter fish tend to be on the right as well. Um, and so this was reassuring as well, because without actually making any sort of decision around constraining this, this ordination, uh, the variation that primarily existed on that first principal component axis was actually sea winter variation. So this last slide uh, is, I think, primarily interesting to me, but I think it's really cool. And so I, I, I'd like to put it up anyway. The last thing that we did was a method called gene set enrichment in which we look for shared signatures of predictive capacity of genes uh, across the genome and see if they're enriched for any functions that we would not expect for a random set of genes. And what we found for all of these groups, thankfully for the CH variation, is that they're all enriched for the same processes. And these processes also make sense for what we would expect for a variation in migratory phenotype. So process, uh, processes associated with heart function, with maturation and growth. So overall, what we found is that we were able to previously detect that major effect locus associated with CH variation. But that association was specific to sex and across the range of North American Atlantic salmon as well. But we also found many genomic paths to CH variation that were revealed by random forest. And there was a lot of significantly predictive variation that was not picked up using genome-wide association that we could detect using random forest. And those mapped onto a few shared biological processes that would make sense for the trait that we're actually interested in as well. So I'd like to thank uh, all of the folks that provided funding and help for this project, uh, especially Jason and Chris at DeepSense who provided ongoing consultation on this project and the machine learning components of this project. Uh, and I'd be happy to take people's questions as well. Thank you so much, Tony. It was a very much informative presentation. And I guess we could wait for people to ask for some questions. See, Bill Cunningham has asked uh, data sources, open data from recreational fishers or commercial. Uh, so the, this data was partially collected from, um, partially from recreational fishery, uh, but also partially from actual DFO uh, counting fences as well. So we have collaborators across uh, Labrador who have done some of the, the catching and, and identification of fish for us. Uh, but then some of this has also been done by direct, directly by DFO researchers as well. So does that kind of answer your question? Oh, great. Okay, I see a yes. Uh, Tony, I have a question myself. So mm -hmm. is there any specific model you're focusing on machine learning to detect these elements? Uh, so which model were we focusing on for, for machine learning? Is mm -hmm. that, uh, so we used random forest uh, okay. for this. Yeah, and this was just, uh, I just used the random forest package in R, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably outdated and, and, and not as good as some other things that people here are probably using now, um, mm -hmm. but it was sufficient for this type of this type of process. And so I, I focus just on maximizing classification rate and minimizing um, the, the out of bag error rate. And this was after uh, testing a few different M tri parameter values as well uh, to see what sort of panel of predictors was, was most useful there. Sounds good. Oh, 
Okay, and I see, do I have another question here? Uh, have I tried different models also? So I haven't tried any other uh, machine learning models yet. One of the ones that we had talked about and that uh, had been suggested by, by Chris and Jason that we may look into for this project in the future is going to be gradient boosting. Um, I think that those kind of uh, supervised predictive models that are in some ways similar to a linear model, but that they're not kind of making inferences about transforming the data into an image. I think those probably have potential for this sort of thing. I'd be interested in doing um, deep learning for, for prediction of traits too, moving forward. The challenge being that, as I understand it, uh, deep learning requires a lot of training data, uh, which we don't really have except the data structure itself. So if other folks have uh, suggestions about that, I'd be really interested to hear what people think too. Uh, someone asks, what kind of pre-processing did I do on the data set? Uh, so for the genomic data, the pre-processing we did was relatively minimal. I aligned it to the reference genome, um, which will, if you do it, even if you do it properly, the algorithm, which people use for alignment to the reference genomes, uh, the Burroughs-Wheeler aligner, the way that it's written, it will uh, align and, and do soft clipping for you automatically. So I didn't do a ton of adapter clipping or anything like that at that stage. Uh, from there, I did do optical deduplication of anything that came out of the sequencer that looked like it was just an artifact from the sequencer. Uh, but that was it for that level of pre-processing. Um, for the actual pre-processing of the machine learn, the data that went into the machine learning model, what we did was that we selected uh, panels that were based on the significance in that, that GWAS test. So even though the GWAS wasn't actually picking up things that were passing significance thresholds, it still could give us kind of a ranking of how significant something was relative to not being significant at all. So we used that as our initial kind of cutoff to build these different panels. So the top 50 most significant SNPs, regardless of whether the p-value is above 0.05 or not, um, and then the top, you know, top 700, top 1,000, so on. Uh, beyond that, the other pre-processing, I don't know if this counts as pre-processing or not, but then we split the data into uh, two-thirds training, one-third prediction data. Um, and then from there, that was what we used for the random forest model. Does that kind of answer your question or is that, I'm not sure if that's the right type of pre-processing or not. Great, okay. So Tony, is there any other interesting projects that you're working on apart from this one? Uh, so for now, this is my primary project. Uh, we are just now in the process of beginning to write this work up. Mm -hmm. um, beyond this, I am going to be moving on to some other work from return salmon data. So we have uh, salmon samples from populations that are adjacent to sites that have some sort of environmental exposure to human impact and some that don't. And so we have fish that have been caught that have been leaving these sites to go spawn at sea and fish that are coming back. And so we're gonna be looking at genetic differences between the ones that are near these sites that are human impacted and ones that are not to mm -hmm. see if there's any regions of the genome that we can pick up that are going to be important potentially in, in determining whether they've been impacted by, by being adjacent to these sites that are, uh, that have been affected by human presence. Um, the other thing that we're looking at kind of really generally is using genomic data to predict future climate impacts on different species as well. Uh, so I was involved in a project uh, that was just published with Kara, uh, Kara Layton from Aberdeen University as the, the lead author. And we looked at Arctic tar populations across Newfoundland and Labrador. And using current environmental conditions and current genomic data, tried to predict how those populations would change genetically across the species range given different climate change scenarios. So I think there's a lot of potential uh, for that type of study going forward. We have a whole bunch of other species with genomic data that we know will be impacted by climate change. And so we're gonna be looking into that type of, uh, that type of problem as well. And Sounds that's- really great. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, thank yeah. you.
Okay, uh, do folks have any more questions or should I, should I wrap up the session now, I guess? Oh, Bill Cunningham asks, have you seen evidence of a genomic effect from fish farms? Uh, I mean, the, the main genomic effect of this has been detected is that we can see introgression or so we can see movement of genes from fish from fish farms into wild populations sometimes in, in sites that are close to uh, fish farms that have had escape events. So what the impact of that actually means going forward, we don't know yet, but that is something that the DFO is kind of looking into as well. Um, and, and whether that has changes in fitness, we also are, are not quite clear on as far as I know, and I'm, I'm not the expert on aquaculture interactions. Um, but we know at least that those genes are finding their way into wild populations. Okay, any, any other remaining questions that folks might uh, be interested in? Oh, thank you. Okay, so I will, uh, oh, I will close out the session then. Thanks for coming everybody and thanks for listening to this talk and the questions as well. Thank you so much, Tony Kess, for being part of this discovery session. We hope to hear a lot of talks in the future sessions with you. So thank you so much for your time and for being here. Great, thank you. Thank you so right. much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.